Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Heroes of Improv. I'm Teresa Bueno. I'm an associate producer of Duluth, and um, I'm also in the cast. And I cannot tell you how thrilled I am today to have with us Stephen Karen, who I might add is the husband to our director, Joe McGinley. So welcome, Stephen. It's so great to have you. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks for having me. I'm grateful. Well, it's our pleasure and honor to have you here. Um, so you are familiar, obviously, with Duluth and what we're doing. Um, yes. The soap opera, the unscripted soap opera. And I'm going right. to start off with... Uh, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about you uh, and your varied background. My God, you've done so many things uh, and are doing so many things. <laughs> uh, I, I love your longstanding group, um, 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 Three for All. Oh, thank you. Um, so tell us, the, the going because you were there in the beginning. You were one of the uh, founders of that. How was that to to be a founder of something that's actually become an institution. <laughs> well, like most institutions, you never uh, know that, or you never think you're going to last more than a month, if that, uh, you know, when you're starting out. But um, yeah, somehow we've hung on. We, we've known each other about 33, 34 years now, but the group Three for All has been around for, this is our 25th year. If we make it to the, to the I think, <laughs> late summer, well, it'll be our 25th year. How we will celebrate that this year, we have no idea. But um, it, it feels, you know, terrific. But, but like I said, you know, you, you never aim for that. You know, what brought us together was a, a series of circumstances and uh, certainly the climate of the, of the improvisation scene at the time in San Francisco in the early 90s, mid 90s. And uh, so, yeah, it, it feels great. I've, I've been honored to be a part of the ground floor of a, of a handful of groups, but Three for All is, uh, has sustained all this time. And I think partly because we're small, we're a small sort of a group of assassins that can get in and get out and uh, there's less moving parts but um and we've had a remarkable uh, support and help from our producers uh judy and glenn eastman over the years so it's it's not just rafe and tim and myself but we've had amazing musicians and and now our, our tech support as we're trying to figure this whole thing out like we all are <laughs> it's so yeah many ways. yeah so and how has the the pandemic, the situation of going to Zoom Prof affected um, your performance free for all. Well, I mean, it's it's just uh, you know, like all of us, it's it's t boned, if you will, the uh, the art form. But I've been learning a lot from watching and listening to Twyla Tharp and her uh, saying that dancers don't just stop dancing, you know. So she. <laughs> knows that Zoom has just been in this extraordinary challenge. And uh, once I saw Twyla Tharp sort of punching her way through it, I could drop my shoulders and realize that we're all um, trying to figure this out together, uh, unique to this art form. I, I liken it to going to Mars, like we've, we've, we've been asked to go to Mars and do a production of Hamlet. And so there are massive limitations but looking for the blessings in that blessings is a bit of a cute term that can get away from us if we're not careful but i think just trying to see where we can grab zoom by the collar and shake it and not let it tell us what to do but we can also use it as a tool and also accept the fact that we're totally screwed right now and live within uh, the limitations. Buster Keaton talked about that. Uh, Carol Burnett talked about that, about the freedom of boundaries, the freedom of, mm -hmm. tight, of tight spaces, if you will. Once you mm -hmm. accept that you're on Mars trying to do Hamlet, um, something can begin there because the fighting goes away and we can start to learn where we, from where we are, you know. 
Yeah. There's a ma- I believe it's the birth of a new art form, if you will. I was just going to ask you about that. You, yeah. Because that's the way I personally see it. I, I, it kind of occurs for me like the TVs in the 50s, you know, like the, yeah. comes television and then there was Broadway and, you know, right. have some plays that came to the TV stage, you know, Master House Theater and things like that. But yeah. they, they're separate and different not to say that they don't have some interface, but they are separate and different. So do you see yourself continuing with Zoom um, of this type of improv even after you can go back to the stage? Oh, completely. Yeah, I, and I think most people will. The, the great advantage is that it allows us to do shows in Japan or, le, to, or in Berlin or, or, you know, down under. It doesn't matter. That, or, or in China, where we may be doing some shows in China, you know, via mm-hmm. Zoom. But uh, I think it is. I think once we accept it, that it is, it's not live theater in the same way that like Playhouse 90 or the Hallmark Hall of Fame back in the day was not a Broadway show. It was rather this televised art form. Once we let it sort of tell us what it is in a sense and reverse engineer off of the limitations, then I think we're going to continue to grow as we all have thus far in the art form. Um, yeah, just the use of filters alone <laughs> has yeah. allowed. Yeah, I, I did a scene recently where Rafe was this kid and I was his imaginary friend and I, I was played him as a cartoon because I had the ability to tr- change myself into Martin, you know, his little imaginary <laughs> friend. And so there was something there that actually was quite surprising and, and uh, enhanced that particular story in a way that we could not do it on stage, no. quite honestly. It will never take the place of it, but I believe if we let it just be what it is without it bossing us around too much that I always think, you know, I always joke that you got to punch Zoom in the face and just kind of keep it in line <laughs> and don't let it, don't let it discourage us, I guess, and, and be a bossy boots, which as we know it can. <laughs> well, it is. And I think the technology is, itself is advancing. So I think there's going to be more and more tools yeah. that are going to become available to us that, you know, even a year from now, there'll be things that are available that aren't today that will be going, oh, cool is that? You know, so uh, I totally agree. So, uh, and I want to ask you too about um, uh, going back a little bit to um, um, Three for All. One of the things about it is your show. The first of your show, you have, mm, for lack of a better word, sort of a short form uh, to it. And then you go into a narrative, a long form which Mm -hmm. can be uh, more dramatic, shall we say, or less less short form-ish, less going for the humor that you guys are fabulous at, not to say that there's not humor. So that was one thing I wanted to ask you. What do you see? Is there a line of demarcation for you as an improvising actor? between the short form and knowing what that is and then moving to the narrative and the more storytelling aspect of it? It's an interesting question. Um, I mean, back in the day, I mean, my training was similar to everybody else's, which I call our street fighting phase where we, we were just, you know, doing theater sports and doing <laughs> small little bursts and games and which is all terrific training. Um, but the way we see it in three for all is that it's all long form. It's all narrative. It's all the narrative. The first half is just small samples of the narrative. And then we air it out in the second half. But we, we approach it as if we could take any of those scenes, if you want to call them that, in the front half of the show and expand them and do an entire evening uh, with an intermission of one of those stories. For us, it's about character and commitment to the story, to each other, to the moment, so that we're able to anchor ourselves in that ethic, if you will. Um, So it is different than just, uh, in a sense, going for the wonderfully spectacular, uh, but very narrow definition of the short form, which is, you know, being fast, funny, and smart, which is Mm -hmm. fantastic. You know, it's incredible. Whose line? 
But I remember that, that he auditioned for, for Whose Line felt like a street fight, uh, similar to what I referenced earlier, which is where I came up with that sort of terminology. Basically, it was very self-centered. Mm. And which is, again, that can be really, you know, you know, Sinatra was self-centered, you know, so who cares? But, um, but when it comes to running like a pack, we have to look at it, three for all does at least, as, as a tight unit where we're all sort of working together with regards to the story. It's a story and characters, what do they want? And so we're able to work vertically, not just pushing out uh, horizontally and, and moving over land when we can, when we have to, to advance a narrative, but to go deeper into character and relationships and um, less of the game and more of the partner, if you will. Got it. So, no. and do you think that talking about pushing it forward, because I think that's one thing that anyone who's in narrative, storytelling, dramatic improv, and I'd like for us to talk about that whole thing also, what yeah. to call it, what to call this piece. <laughs> and, um, uh, but that the challenge is always, at least from my perspective, the plot monster. Like, like <laughs> blend between plot driven and character relationship driven um, that I think that a lot of us uh, struggle with that. Like, I, I, I'd like to hear what you think. Is it like, is there a line of demarcation or is it sort of a continuum that yeah, a little bit and a little bit and somewhere in between? I don't know if I'm making myself clear. How do you I'm not, regard I'm not totally clear on, go, go ahead, Teresa. I'm sorry, I'm not totally clear on the, the question. Like, but how I, do you I, guard, how do you guard, or do you guard, um, not to be so driven by the plot to advance mm -hmm. the story, to make the story interesting? Oh my gosh, we have to have an interesting story. Oh, did you have mm -hmm. to see that I have a knife, you know, or whatever, so. Um, well, well, you're pointing to something kind of interesting that is sort of negative space of, of, for improvisers, which is this and re relationship to this storyteller. <clears throat> and I don't mean in the good way. I mean, this, our, our heads are going to understand the nature of the head and how it works. And, and um, that, that's a separate question that we could do an entirely different interview on or, or a full interview, um, which is sort of how, how you do one thing is how you do anything. So you're going to come into the work and you're going to do it like you've done the rest of life. And if you're back here and trying to be safe, then you'll do that. But if you're pushed out into third and you're trying to control, then you're probably going to do improv like that for a while. What you're talking about requires an understanding of style, like an understanding of genre, it depends on the story itself. Sure. But for me, I, I know for myself early on, because I was working with absolute geniuses i mean intellectual geniuses improvisational geniuses physical geniuses um just storytelling just massive firepower for me because i didn't feel like i was very smart i didn't come from that background college was not something that i heard a lot about growing up you know um I didn't think I was very smart. So it required me to do my best to keep it simple for myself and, and also realize if, uh, look to what's already here, what's already happened within a style. It can be in Jane Austen. And if, you know, if, if there are certain simple plot devices, by the way, there's not a lot of plot in Jane and it's a great place <laughs> to practice wants. So for me, I'll go back to just the acting question. What do I want? What happens when I get it? And what happens when I don't? Um, the other thing that's really helpful is to talk about it as a group. Look, there's times you got to just like run ahead. But I was, I was doing Pulp Playhouse back in the day, which was Brian Lohman's uh, brainchild back in the mid 90s. And eventually it became True Fiction Magazine. Uh, a lot of the members of the group mm -hmm. became that. But 
you have to be careful because you're going to fake yourself out. You're going to fake each other out. You're going to actually do a front handspring in a scene and actually end up in the orchestra pit. You're the equivalent thereof if you're not careful. Uh, when you start uh, not letting existing offers be enough. So, uh, I mean, I remember we did espionage and no one knew what the hell was going on. So it's like the audience is confused, we're confused, we're putting out fires and we're patching over here. We're trying to like add new characters. So rather than it organically coming out of scene to scene to scene, you know where you want to land, so to speak, sometimes, but you don't always need that or want that. I would say learn to live in the world of soap opera or of evening soap opera, the, the, you know, the nuances of that. Know the world you're in. And I believe uh, I would lean on the, at least early on, on the side of simplicity. And what is simplicity if not letting what you have be enough and then going down into those relationships? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I love that. Let what you have be enough. I'm making a note. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> yeah, want, want what you have is how I put it in class. Or, um, yeah, I mean, it's so, we have all these really, really smart people. I never included myself in that group. Uh, so I've, that's how the space object for me became what it is because I, I was just hiding out and knowing I was going to be fired soon. <laughs> so I thought, well, at least I'll know where the coffee cup is. You know, I don't know where that's going to be, but whoosh, there's the coffee cup and I know where that is. And let me see what's in there. And, and I found out there was a lot in there if I let it be. Yeah. Which kind of like talking about that. I'd like to circle back a little bit and go back to, shall we say, the beginning, the history. And how how you see that improv has changed from whenever you first started? Like, what what was the world of improv like whenever you started? Well, like I said, it was really like popping. I was growing up in an era of sort of the monsters of rock in San Francisco at the time. So you had like the committee was just starting to cool down and they were this, this unbelievable 60s, 70s era group that had been sort of influenced by some of the Chicago and Canadian you know, schools. Mm -hmm. And then what I always refer to as the San Francisco State Mafia, you know, people coming out of there like uh, like McShane and, and Proops and Brian Lohman, but then you had like massive superstars like Barbara Scott and Regina Saizi and Olan Jones and all of this. It was all just sort of popping, but it all, like I said, was like super, super fast and cerebral um, in a way that was right. I mean, that, that's sort of what it was, that, that was what it needed to be. That's what it was, it was celebrating, if you will. But for me, early on, I, I found I could get with enough skills. I always thought I'm not gonna be able to keep up with these people on the flats. I'll have to catch them in the mountains. That's what I thought I'll have to sort of try and reel them in up over the Alps, you know, with a sound effects or being able to know with a, you know, space object work or the horse or, or my hair, anything I had, you know, to just sort of hang, to just hang on stage with, with these, like I said, just unbelievable, uh, just, incredible performers. But what started to happen in the late 80s, going into like the early 90s was, again, the influence of Pulp Playhouse and, and groups surrounding that, like uh, with the influence of Brian Lohman and, and, uh, and narrative, really strong narrative improvisers who were great actors was, and then Rafe Chase, we started to go down into sustained story, sustained story that was character driven, not so much plot, plot would take care of itself, but things started to feel like they almost started to slow down in a way, here and on stage in a way, and it was, there was a richness that could not be denied there. It almost felt like we were, uh, trick shooting in a great way. It was like the, the Wild West show, 
you know, there's Annie Oakley and there's Buffalo Bill and we're shooting cans off a fence, she was in a mirror and all that stuff was really popping. But Rafe in the early nineties, there was a show, oh no, late eighties, 80, like 89 at 450 Geary, right there in San Francisco. I always say, if you go by 450 Geary as an improviser, get out of the Uber or get out of the cab or your car and pour a beer in the street. I'm still working on getting a plaque there because that was the night that we tried something that felt like a suicide mission, which was Rafe trying to do a sustained story for 40 minutes, which today is like, that's nothing, right? Right, but right. Back, back, back then it was a suicide mission. We didn't know if we were coming back, you know, we didn't know what, well, yeah. would we be giving people's money back, you know? And that to me is where things started to really change for on the scene certainly in San Francisco, but very quickly it became a West Coast thing. People were very interested in that because you could feel it was like we were uh, we were being fed by something as mm -hmm. opposed to some of the awesomeness of, of living on sugar, which is the short mm -hmm. you know, version. Mm -hmm. Again, don't get me wrong about three for all. We do plenty of stuff that is just kind of like, there's plenty of dicking around still going on. It's not always like, you know, my character's wants, you know, it's fun to have pizza for breakfast sometimes. So we're not prudish in that way. But there is when it comes to going there, if you will, going deep, to have that available and to have that experience is what we started to experience in the late 80s, 89, right there at 450, which used to be the ACT Playhouse. I will never, I mean, I get chills talking about it. I drive up that street. And I look at that place and I just remember that hallway and I remember the sheer terror of going in and the sheer, what would you call it? Like almost a sublime, uh, just being carried out of there by what just happened to us. Not mm -hmm. that we did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where oh. things started to change. Like being used by something. Totally. Exactly. Channels, call it whatever you will. Again, that gets away from us pretty quick. But I would say show, learning to show up and stay out of the way, that's when I really started to experience what that meant. And again, it was the pioneering work of, of Rafe and, and that whole posse and the mafia of San Francisco State at the time that really dug in there because they were actors. I mean, they were true mm -hmm. actors. and. Uh, yeah, Ed Hodson, he left three for all. It used to be four of us very early on. And Ed took off to go to Broadway. But Ed was like, I remember being at Ed's house and looking around, I see cigarettes like in an ashtray and I see these books piled up here and I realized they were plays. And I didn't know really what a play was. And I thought, oh, Ed's an actor. So I was like hanging with actors. So I didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> but I knew it when I felt it. Yeah. On stage. So I've been sort of raised by wolves. Yeah. Well, you know, I feel that way. So do you, do you, um, just curious a little bit, uh, do you think that the East Coast has been less receptive of this sort of, or how do you think? Maybe don't let me lead you. How do you think it's oh, I, received on the East Coast? You, you well, I, I don't know. I mean, Chicago has to be, you know, uh, so much of the Herald and the longer stories, you know, started to sort of come up there that led to sketches like by Nichols and May. I mean, that that can't be denied. You know, we were standing on their shoulders for right. sure. But this particular, like, vibe or style of, of sustained story is definitely, for me, that, that to me is such a West Coast thing. I, I don't know, but, you know... I, I would say this, I would say the East Coast and beyond and the world came to study and still comes to study on the West Coast because of that particular style, right, of, of music that we're playing. It's just a way, it's not the way. Mm -hmm. But but I think, I think, you know, New York, yeah, the, definitely the East Coast found, found value in it. Um, but I don't, they, they never felt like it was really humming out there. And I don't know why, I but I mean, you can't deny, I mean, you've got UCB and beyond. I mean, those are all just unbelievably powerful schools that, you know, have just done so such incredible work. But I think there still was this emphasis on maybe some of the shorter, um, mm -hmm. 
if you will, scene scene work. Yep, yep I agree. So what yeah. do you think that this this thing that that San Francisco was, shall we call it, the epicenter of this particular type of improv? What? How would you describe it? Because there's been a lot of conversation with uh, uh, people we've talked about: dramatic versus uh, narrative versus long form. I mean, it, could you? Do you think we could even come to agreement about what to call it? No, I mean agreement. There's always going to be. You know how we are. <laughs> I mean, it's just the same old angry faces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whether we could be in an Amish sewing circle right now and someone would be bitching about that stitch. It should be a cross you know? stitch, you know? Yeah, which is just the deal. But um, I don't know. And I, I would say whatever name you come up with, I would think reverse engineer on what would help people understand it better mm -hmm. and what would get and what would remove obstacles to actually experiencing it not doing it, you know, because we like to do improv. But for me, improvisation for me is a stance. Uh, like, I, you've heard me say this probably in class, but I never ever like being told or telling improvisers to just have fun because it's like fun is what happens. You know, I think yeah. when certain elements are in place. So, so you know what? call it whatever you want it could be blah 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 you know as long as we have a shared understanding in the ensemble of of a shared sensibility if you will a mm -hmm. shared sensibility what's the ethic what's important mm -hmm. uh, what what do we believe what um what features or what what elements need to be in place in order for this thing to show up it's almost like a conjuring it's almost like you know, um, the spirits won't show up as my dog is coughing right now. Perfect timing to take the piss out of my, my, all my theories. Dramatic. <laughs> He's my teacher. Yeah. Um, I really believe w whatever will summon the, uh, and what conditions, what will summon the, this, the stories, yeah. you know, how do we stay put till the stories show up? And this is always oh. the biggest, mm -hmm. this is the biggest thing for me in my head. The great, it's attaching story to stuff and that's not a good thing. Yeah, there's definitely a difference. I've been doing it long enough to know that whenever th something has been manufactured versus when something appears, you know? And uh, yeah. there, there's a big difference between those two and a, a, a lot more uh, fun, if you will, uh, to be carried along by that which that appears uh, like a wave versus, you know, getting out there and, and, and paddling and try to make it happen, you know, so I hear. Yeah, that. yeah. And, and the danger is when you talk that way, that people are going to dismiss it and they're going to think, ah, oh, it's airy fairy or whatever they'll call it, you know, north of the bridge, as we used to call it in San Francisco. <laughs> but for me, it's 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 absolutely <laughs> it's like earth moving equipment it's like giant those cranes in oakland that unload the ships this stuff is the only thing that can do the heavy lifting everything else is just like being clever which is great that's a skill but i feel i i feel like that's just an arrow in the quiver it's the whole it's the whole arsenal that we have to look at here and also learning to improvise on improv's terms tell it instead of us telling it us how it's going to be and mm -hmm. these are not theories. They are if you're talking about them, but go find out. Right. You know, and do, you know, there's no, you know, there's different ways of, uh, hang on. Hi, I'm being, in, okay. Our dog <laughs> is being called into the other room. Uh, look, yeah, go find out if this, there's lots of ways to improvise. Somebody asked me once in an interview, do you think space object work is, is uh, necessary for great improv. I said, no, absolutely not. Uh, for me, I, I, that's what I favor because I, I believe it's an, an integral part of telling the stories in this particular art form, especially the narrative. But no, you don't need that. As long as you're all speaking the same language, that's when other primates who are watching these shows will respond. If there's a, 
a sort of a shared frequency and groups quite often are not on the same frequency. They are valuing different mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. which, I, which is fine. It, I would just find out, you know, yeah. without turning on each other. Yeah, we'll make sure the turning will happen. Yeah. Make sure everybody's playing the same game. I mean, if uh, I'm thinking we're going to speak in the same language, yeah, speak in the same yeah. language. And then, as always, once the gossip starts, that's when you can start to feel the corrosion uh, mm -hmm. from the inside of groups. This is going to happen. It needs to be addressed, I think, from day one. It's coming. Those wolves will catch you as a group because it's a family and we come out of trauma and broken families and dysfunction. And guess what? Yep. Guess how, yep. That's how we do our groups. Yeah, which kind of, that's the other thing I wanted to ask you is like, what advice that do you have for us uh, as we embark on this great adventure of called Duluth the Improvised Opera? the cast, the team um, in general, what coming from someone who's had a team together for like 23 years, you said? <laughs> 25 this year. 25, yeah. 25, my bad. Yeah. Um, us, yeah. The, what would you recommend? Like asking an, like uh, uh, the grandfather and the, and the grandmother that have been married for 60 years, how did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I almost, again, all I have is my own experience, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so again, based on my own experience of groups that have stayed together, like three for all and groups that have not stayed together, which is probably more accurate that I've been involved in and, and ones that have changed profoundly. Look, early on, understand the concept that it's not them. When you're in a group, it's always them that person, that offer, it's always them. And as early as you can, at least, again, this is just my experience. Uh, know that it's you, <laughs> you're the problem, in a sense, in your own life. There's at least, there's a sense of, you can do something about that, but also it goes out from there. If you learn to understand yourself with compassion, I believe still that like, that kindness is the most valuable tool for any improviser, especially in ensemble, just simple kindness, because in the end, based on my experience, nothing else is going to do the heavy lifting, not understanding, not, uh, not theorizing, not being right. It, nothing's going to do the heavy lifting. I believe only kindness with ourselves and with each other in an art form that requires requires us to wipe out, not just kind of wipe out, but to be obliterated from time to time. There's only one thing that for me has allowed groups that I've been in to sustain and to endure. And that's a sense of factoring that in early and taking care of each other to understand rather than be understood. It's the tallest order there is. We're not really able to do it, but to forgive and to understand and to show kindness toward ourselves and others and not always in that order. Not always like, hey, if I don't take care of me, I can't take care of you. I don't believe that. I think if I sometimes strive to take care of you, it actually does come back to me too. So it's not either or there, mm -hmm. at least again, in my experience, because it's always like, I've got to put the thing on first, the, all the analogies on the airplane before I can help. Yes, yes, I get the concept. But there's other times where you just reach out. If you see someone struggling in your group, call them up and say, can I help you? Can I help you up? Can I reach yeah. out my hand? And, you know, because again, improv is not going to, Improv, if it's if you're quote, I think really in it and really engaged in it, it's going to lay you out. You're gonna be knocked, you're the wind is gonna be knocked out of you. I remember we were improvising a show at the Gary Marshall, and at the end, there were so many people on stage, so much which was happening, and Paul Rogan hit the deck and was knocked out, like unconscious, unconscious on the stage, paying audience, lights, music. It all was happening. And Paul, I remember, was there 
kind of coming to and we all got around him and then we got him on his feet and he was back in the game so it's like <laughs> that image that's all oh, that's that, yeah that's what I, that's I. called <laughs> Right, exactly. And he picked it right up, you know, and yet, but that's the image I try and use with myself. And I can tell you right now, the people that have stopped uh, long enough to reach out their hand to me over the years and say, I see you struggling. Um, you know how it is after shows when mm. we get by ourselves mm. and our head gets us like, mm, you're mm. this and that there and they're that and they're this and that offer. And I'm tired of, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. It's the same stuff's gonna play out in any improv troupe. I would say check it early before you wreck it. <laughs> Cause I, you know, we're gonna wreck it. We're gonna try to wreck it. It's like, I just have, I live with a monster and he's me and he's just not allowed to drive the motor home anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I've just learned to go, oh, Frankenstein. You know, because he's going to be like, that guy is this. That group, by the way, they broke off and formed their own group. They're this. And <laughs> it's all the same story. It's like, but you just know that you, you're living, you're chained to an idiot. I am. I am. I live with a monster. I think it's, it's kind of what it is to be a human being. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, the, one who's trying yeah. to improvise. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, you're going to meet yourself in, in, in improvisation and you are really going to meet yourself and your family in ensemble. Mm. You're going to meet the family. And mm -hmm. it's like, don't be surprised because the ego will, will want to go. You know, it is all about the fainting couch or the opera. Everything's an opera. Yeah. Well, so then this has been absolutely delightful. Thank you so much for all of this I, I before we go I want to ask is there any other words of wisdom or anything <laughs> that you'd like to share with us that are anything more you want to say because I'm all ears and I'm sure our audience will be too uh, you know I god I just go on and on but I, I would just say yeah the best thing you can do as an improviser is is uh tend your garden I would say that is work do you know we, that's such a popular thing these days you got to do the work you know that's fine but do the work here first this is the first relationship if there's things in the way that's just the path i would say if you really want to travel lighter as an improviser and and start to feel what it's like to, to get some wind beneath the wings and actually learn to fly it starts here mm -hmm. start with this uh, this ensemble Start with this theater company <laughs> and there's plenty of drama, right? So, so I would say that, that again, if I, I, I may have touched on that earlier, but I, I would say really learn what it's like to develop a good relationship here uh, so that it can go out. Because if you don't transmit your pain, you're going to trans, you know, if you don't transform your pain, you're going to transmit it in, a, in an improv troupe. That's Richard Rohr said that if you don't, transform it you'll transmit it and and so know that you're improvising like you've done everything else in your life and if you can try to see that with a sense of compassion and and understanding and gentleness and kindness toward yourself and others that will leave room leave room for the miracle to show up mm -hmm. yeah yeah because it's I, I don't know the, uh, muji the great master has a great saying don't don't settle to be a Hollywood star when you are the universe. Mm. And I love that. Don't settle to be an improv star. <laughs> what a drag. <laughs> Don't be good, you know, just learn to run together, run together and see what shows up. Thank you. Well, uh, to the audience, I, if uh, you want to hear more uh, of what Stephen has to say, I highly recommend any class of his that you could be in. And we're going to put in the comments uh, links to uh, his Facebook page, to uh, also uh, all the information that uh, if, if you've got, you can send me some more. And we'll make sure that people can get in touch with you readily and take advantage of your great wisdom and your great heart. Just, just like, man, there's not a bigger heart in the industry than yours. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Stephen, for being with us today. You're very welcome, Teresa. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye now.